Hi, uh, we've been talking about stars in their domain, so it's a bit difficult to speak now about my own research. I'm going to present my ISAT Junior Fellowship project, which is entitled Im Imvula. Imvula, it's a Zulu word. It means rainfall in Zulu. And it's also the acronym for my project, which deals with intraseasonal descriptors of rainfall variability in South Africa. So let's travel just a few years back in the past. In December 1998, uh, the South African nation was very young at that time, just four years after the end of apartheid. And the hero of the nation, the father of the rainbow nation, the president, the first black president of South Africa, President Nelson Mandela, was nearly killed because a building collapsed in the town he was visiting. It was the small town of Mtata in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa. And it was huge emotion throughout the world, including, of course, in South Africa, and even in the US, because the New York Times wrote a paper to say that, fortunately, President Mandela went unhurt after that building collapse. Why did it happen? Because in that small town, in that given day, uh, there was a severe storm that caused a tornado. That tornado brought huge amount of rainfall, which destabilized the soil, which caused major damage in the dwellings and in the buildings. So this shows that the South African climate can be violent, and that sometimes there are some climate extremes that can bring huge impacts on the societies, on the environment. So this can be important to consider these high impact events caused by climate variability, and now also by climate change. But working on the climate extremes requires putting that extreme into context, because when you want to work on an extreme, you have to compare it with the rest of the time to know that it's really an extreme. So I'm going to present a little bit the context of the South African climate, which is a bit complicated. As you can see, just looking at these pictures that we have in South Africa, we have very diverse landscapes, very diverse ecosystems. Actually, all of this relates to very different climates as well. Why is it so complicated? Because, first of all, the South African continent is under the influence of two very different oceanic currents. Warm, one warm current coming from the South Indian Ocean, bringing moisture, bringing warm water, and one cold current coming from the Southern Ocean, bringing very, very cold water from the deep ocean. So just in a few tens of kilometers along the South Coast of South Africa, you can have a difference of 10 10 degrees just in a few tens of kilometers. That's a very important difference. Over the land, it's also quite complicated. The southwestern tip of the continent has a Mediterranean climate with dominant rainfall in winter. So from June to September, it's their winter, it's our summer. And this is the main rainy season for that part of Africa. Along the south coast of South Africa, you have rainfall throughout the year because of the influence of that warm current which brings huge amounts of moisture and because of topography, with topographic ascents that cause water to precipitate. On the northwestern part of the country, there, that's almost a desert. This is very arid conditions, mostly uh, throughout the year, uh, with just a few showers in, uh, during the austral summer season. And for the rest of the region, we have a big region under tropical influence with strong, abundant rainfall occurring during one main rainy season from November to February. And just to complexify the problem a little bit further, just in the middle of, of all of these climate zones, we have a high mountain environment, a high mountain massif, which, looks, which is called the Drakensberg, which is more than 3,000 meters above sea level, and which has a strong influence on atmospheric circulations, moisture fluxes, and of course, on the regional climate. So this is just to say that even the mean climate, the climate context of South Africa is not an easy one. Now, of course, that climate varies in time, and I'm going to present a little bit some of the variations that we can record in the climate of South Africa. The first question you may would like to know is what is the regional influence of climate change? Of course, when you have a climatologist in front of you, you think about climate change. So here, these are maps that show the regional effects of climate change in summer rainfall, so during the main rainy season of phosphorus summer. The first map above is the changes in summer rainfall. These changes actually seem to be quite weak on average. And this is obtained by the average of 15 climate models which participated to the fifth assessment report of IPCC. The second map 
among these 15 models, we count the number of models which are in agreement with the map shown just above. And over South Africa, that agreement actually is quite weak, I would say. So when looking at this, we have the impression that climate change has no big impact over that region. Actually, it's a wrong statement because this is just the mean evolution of climate. But that mean conceals two opposite phenomena. The first one is that for the future climate, we will have an increased number of dry days occurring during the rainy season, so less rainy days. The second effect is that when it rains, it will rain more. And what is particularly important is that the climate extremes are going to be more intense in the future than they are now, which means that extreme rainfall are going to be even more extreme in the future. Just to illustrate that point a little bit, because that can cause major high impact events in the future, I worked here on two regions of South Africa so here, the bluish colors are for the Malawi region, so Long Lake Malawi, shown in that map here. And the reddish colors are for the Tanganyika region along, uh, around Lake Tanganyika. These curves show two different, uh, two different scenarios of the IPCC. The solid lines are the nightmare scenario, the pessimistic scenario we'd like to avoid. The dashed lines are the enthusiastic scenario, the scenario we would like to meet to meet the Paris Agreement context. And then these maps, these curves show you the evolution of climate extremes with time. What we can see is that the climate extremes are going to be even more extreme according to all of the climate models that we have been working with. The only difference is that the rainfall amount associated with each of these of, you, of these extremes can be different from one model to another, but all of the models simulate an evolution, an increase in the rainfall amount associated with climate extremes over that region. So if I just summarize a little bit the effects of climate change over South Africa, well, there is no good news, because at the same time, we can have an increased frequency of drought, and yet also an increased likelihood of flash floods of building collapse like that that occurred in December 1998 in Tata, because we have more intense rainfall and yet less rainy days. So no good news to expect from climate change in this region. If you guys wish to finish this workshop with good news, perhaps you shouldn't have invited a climatologist. Yet, climate is also variable for, for natural causes. And this is our job to separate what is caused by the natural variability of the climate system on what is influenced or a little bit modified by human influence. So now, let's talk about variations of the climate at higher frequencies. This is related to natural variability of the climate system. Here, using observations, so now we are not in the model anymore, we are just dealing with rain gauge, so observations of rainfall. We've been able to identify three significant periodicities in South African rainfall one at the internal time scales, so we have like oscillations every two to eight years, and some of the decadal time scale, which are a bit longer in frequency and in time. These variations in South African rainfall are due actually to some changes that occur in the Pacific Ocean. And these are modes intrinsic to the ocean that imply lots of energetic, lots of water changes, and this is a natural phenomenon. What we can say is that when the Pacific Ocean is cold, we tend to have wet conditions over South Africa. This is also, the we can say the other way around. When the Pacific Ocean is warm, which we can call a, an El Nino event, we have an increased likelihood of drought over South Africa. And this is just because the Pacific Ocean changes, that the atmospheric circulation changes, and that instead of having unstable profiles in the atmosphere over Africa, we have stable profiles that inhibit convection and that create dry conditions. So this is just to show that the climate system is complex. Changes in that part of the world can have consequences on the other part of the world. Climate also varies at higher frequencies. And for example, here we have a satellite image showing a high convective band. So this is a front of storms. 
and each of these rich part of the, of the image is caused by a cumulus, a convective cloud, which can bring huge amounts of rainfall over South Africa. The typical duration of this kind of bands is typically two to four days. So here we are really working at the weather time scale. We are dealing with meteorology, not climate. But all of these systems interact with each other. And one important point is that this kind of events can cause major climate extremes. So overall, if I try to give you an overview of climate extremes in South Africa, the climate extremes tend to happen when we have a large-scale convective band most of the time. These convective bands are more intense, more frequent when there are cold conditions in the Pacific. This was the case in December 1998 when President Mandela nearly had this accident. And this kind of phenomena are going to increase in intensity in the future. So what we consider now for a climate extreme could become even more intense in the future. So here there is major concern because of the impact of this phenomena on what they could cause on their societies on the, on the, on the, and on the environment, sorry. So this brings me to the first goal of the Imvula project. Try to understand the causes of climate variability and if you have a better understanding of climate, you can hope that you can make a better prediction of climate. And here the original part of Imvula is that we're working and considering climate variability like a continuum. Instead of working a very specific time scale and separating weather and natural variability and climate change, we consider variability as a whole. And we try to analyze what we can predict what is hardly predictable, and consider all of these time scales together. This can help us better adapt to the future changes that we fear about rainfall in that region, and more generally about the evolution of climate. The second goal of Imvula well, is to try to avoid another nightmare scenario, which would be caused by what we call a positive feedback. So this is the kind of phenomena that make the system getting stronger and stronger, and it's very difficult to stop it once it started evolving. Here, what we fear is that we could have rainfall extremes that could destabilize the soils, like what happened to, to President Mandela. These effects on the soils could modify carbon fluxes. Why is it important? Because the soil are the main reservoir of carbon on Earth. So potentially, if you modify the soil, you could release huge amount of carbon. And the nightmare scenario would be that this carbon from some CO2, which increases climate change, climate change increasing extreme rainfall, and we could have a feedback. This is what we would like to avoid, and that's why we've been also working on soil sciences in the Imvola project. So now I'm going to show you some results that we've obtained. The first one is uh, based on the climate part of Imvula, and we've tried to model, to simulate a rainfall extreme of um, uh, an event associated with a high rainfall amount over the region. To make this simulation, we've been working on the supercomputer that we have here in the data center of UBFC here in Dijon. And this was re really required to have the power, the numerical resources, uh, to re re resolve these kind of events with a high spatial resolution. What you need to know is that most of the models which are used by IPCC to make their assessment report are global models which try to resolve the climate of the Earth, the entire Earth, at about a 50 to 100 kilometer resolution which is very nice to study global climate change, but which is not precise enough when we deal with a region as complex as South Africa. Remember all of this patchwork of climate that I've been presenting to you, it's not really well seen by a model at 100 kilometer resolution. Because just one example, the warm current coming from the Indian Ocean is just about 10 kilometers large. So it cannot appear in those types 
of climate models. So we need to have a better resolution, a finer or more precise model. And here, using the CPUs that we have in our data center and using our supercomputer, we've been able to run a model using two nested domains. The first domain is fed by a global model, and the second domain is nested in the first domain. The first domain is at a 10 kilometer resolution, and the second domain is at a two kilometer resolution, covering all of the South Africa country. Now, what we'd like to know, is it really important to reach such high resolutions? So we are going to, to see what happens, what an, a climate extreme look like when we look at some maps. Here on the map above, you have the climate extremes as seen by the global model at a 60 kilometer resolution. You can see that locally you can have some rainfall amounts that are about 200 millimeters in a day. Just for you to know, in Dijon, on average, uh, we can have about, let's say, 65 millimeters per month. So here, just in one day, we have the equivalent of quarter of three months of rainfall in Dijon. It's about two months of rainfall in Besançon. So this is huge amount, and this is why it can cause major impacts. And here, this is the view that a global model can have of that climate extreme. The map below, it's, uh, it's not a direct measurement of rainfall. It's an estimate, estimate of rainfall by satellite at a 30 kilometer resolution. So you can see that it's not exactly the same picture as the global model. The global model is not perfect. It's not that bad, but it's not perfect. It's not really in, in agreement with what the satellites can see. Now, this is the result that we have with our model at 10 and at 2 kilometers. The 10 kilometer domain looks like the global model, which is quite logical because that regional model has been forced, laterally, has been fed by the global model. Still, it's not perfect. But when you look at the two kilometer domain, it improved the results a lot, and you seem to better capture the characteristic of that rainfall extremes when you compare it to satellite. When we zoom a little bit further, you can see all of these details where you, you can all, almost identify the single clouds that form rainfall. And all of this has been obtained just by calculation. And I find it, that it's a nice result, just to think that with calculation, we are able to, to approach, to approximate a system that is intrinsically chaotic. So this is the first type of results we've been able to obtain using that uh, uh, eyesight funding and that Im uh, Imvula project. The second task has been on soil sciences and once again, using that funding of the eyesight uh, program, we've been able to buy some probes that measure carbon, carbon fluxes in the Drakensberg Mountains of South Africa. So here are my colleagues have selected two watersheds. Uh, these watersheds have a similar climate, a similar soil. They're in the similar region of South Africa. The only difference is that the South African colleagues in, the, in those parts of the, the country have a big observatory of natural sciences. And here, they try to have two different strategies for vegetation burning because vegetation burning is quite often used in South Africa by farmers to enrich the soil, but we've never been able to really know what are the consequences of those kind of practices on carbon fluxes. So here, we have two watersheds with very contrasted strategies of vegetation burning. One of the catchment is completely protected by fire. As soon as there is natural fire, they try to stop it when it reaches that catchment. And the other catchment, they force a vegetation burning every two years so that they can, can have a kind of practice close to what the farmers usually do in that region. And now my colleagues have been able to put these instruments to measure carbon fluxes in those rivers, in those parts of the Drakensberg. Just for you to know, it looks like this. So now, I think that you understood that in my own project, 
I've stayed here in Dijon working on computers, and I've sent my colleagues to South Africa to put these instruments. There is something I screwed somewhere, I think. Perhaps you'd like to see what our carbon probes look like. Well, it's interesting. Have a look there. They're interesting too. So this is a carbon probe that they, are, they, they had installed in one of the watersheds. So inside that pipes, there is the probe measuring carbon concentrations in the rivers. Here it is. And here, thanks to the magic of computers, now we get some data. So it's not my specialty, so I wouldn't be able to interpret this data for you. But what is usually a good ac accomplishment is that now the probes are installed and the data are automatically sent to us. And now we can work with them because they arrive in our data center here in Dijon. And now we are starting working with them. And, um, and we, we already see that there are some differences. And now we have to interpret and understand these differences. So that iSight project was um, a great project. It would have been even greater if we had got more funding, but unfortunately, it was not the case. But we already began working, and I just would like just to say that even now, uh, at this meeting, it's complicated to see what consequences that project will have because we are producing the results right now. We have one PhD. We have some data arriving to us, but just a few months of data to work with. So even now, we don't know how the story will end. What is sure is that without that eyesight funding, we would not, never have been able to send some probes to Dr Drakensberg. We would not have been able to obtain all of these results on climate extremes. To which extent that project will count in the future for the region, it's still too early to know that. Just to conclude, I didn't want to conclude on a kind of failure because I didn't get more funding to, to pursue the work, so I'm just going to, work, to talk to you about serendipity, how that, those ideas, how this project was built. It all started actually with the, another project which was rejected. I just wanted to have a PhD funding on the predictability of extremes, and I could not get the funding I hoped to have. So I was a bit frustrated, I was a bit angry, actually, and I went out to run just because I needed to do something. So I went out to run, and I was in New Zealand at that time, and so I went in the park close to my house just to run, and I, I was angry. And I arrived at the visitor center of Christchurch, and in New Zealand, you may know that a visitor center is called information site, eyesight. And now it was a kind of, I knew how I could get the funding to make my research. So it was completely, uh, because I had a first rejection, that I had the ID to run and that I get the ID to, to make a, an application for that eyesight. So sometimes you never know which ways you will get the funds. But in the end, it was nice to have this possibility and this opportunity to make a research. What is a bit ironic now is that even if we had not been able to get the European funds we would like, we, we had hoped to get, well, we've been able to recycle some of these ideas for an international research project, with, which is now the new name of the Joint International Laboratories of CNRS between France here and New Zealand. And so in the end, the ideas I had first in New Zealand have fed actually another project for international, international cooperations between France and New Zealand. So it was not planned at all in the beginning, but in the end it's not really a failure, it's just another way to reach our goal. Well, thank you very much, Benjamin. Do we have uh, questions for our colleague? Yes. Thank you. Okay, um, my question is about uh, the first objective of the Imbula project. 
on the prediction side. Uh, did it involve uh, any AI uh, programs? Because I see that you have uh, the capacity to make uh, some big calculations, but you in no way have spoken about uh, AI technology which can help uh, greatly in this domain because it's about processing uh, lots of data and, uh, and uh, bringing uh, some predictions. So this is, uh, by definition, what is AI doing right now? And I guess this question brings up also the bigger question of why we are doing this uh, colloquium event so we can know what everybody else is working on and so we can see some synergies to work together because this is something which has not been really discussed during those two days, how we can work together to, to bring the research further. Thank you. So to answer your first question, we never used AI so far. Uh, our strategies to make the predictions is mostly based on the numerical modeling using climate models, which will try to make the predictions over time. As far as I know, when the guys in climate sciences have tried to use AI, most of the time they have been able to confirm the relationship that they already knew existed. So far, machine learning or this kind of algorithm have not been able to discover really relevant new relationships that were not discovered by human people. But this is a quite young science as well, so I think that the potential is huge. We just need to explore it a little bit. So just to get to your second point, it would be really nice to see if by working together on such huge amount of data, we could go a little bit further than just being a climatologist who tries to use AI but doesn't really understand it. Perhaps working together would make the difference. We have another question yes. from another. So I understood you, you, you focus your work on the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, is it because uh, the, the, the data are uh, more pertinent to identify, to have more chance to match uh, experimental observation of extreme, uh, extreme uh, meteorological events? And is there, is there any difference with the northern hemisphere? Is, the, is, it, is, it, more, is it easier to, to find the experimental matches rather than done in the, northern in, done in the northern hemisphere like we experienced a few weeks ago in, in France? From a climate point of view, both hemispheres are a bit different. Our northern hemisphere has been a bit perturbed by the emissions of aerosols, which were due to the burning of coal, of petroleum, and that deeply changed the climate that we have under all latitudes. But there are, were other kinds of perturbations that were recorded in the Southern Hemisphere that don't exist in the Northern Hemisphere. These were not really climate change. These were because of some of the products that were used by humanity a few decades ago that completely destroyed the ozone layer over the continent of Antarctica. And this completely changed the vertical profiles of temperature, which makes that the, the storms, the wind, the, the westerly winds in the mid-latitudes shifted and went towards, propagated and shifted, went towards the south. And this was quite early. This happened already at the Second World War, and this accelerated and concerned the second half of the century. And now people are interested in those shifts in the West Orleans because under an increasing concentration of greenhouse gases, this could be the kind of perturbations that we could have in both hemispheres. And from that point of view, the southern hemisphere led the way and showed what we can have in terms of impact when the winds change their latitude. This can be interesting for us in the northern hemisphere to learn what happened in the southern one, just to anticipate a little bit the kind of risk that we could face in the future. Okay. I think we'll have to stop here. Um, thank you very much, uh, Benjamin.